Okay. Thank you, Eliane, and thank you all for coming. Um, and thanks, Yael, for agreeing to be discussing. I'm looking forward to the conversation after, after I give the paper. Um, Eliane sketched what my research is about, but just to um, expand on that a little bit, so I, my PhD research was with different kinds of activist groups, some of which I suppose some people wouldn't even really um, define as ac activists or radical activists, so the human rights NGO I worked with, for example, the municipal party are slightly different forms of um, the more direct action, civil disobedience um, kinds of groups that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to focus on that, but the argument I'm making specifically with the notion of complicity is something I'm developing in relation to the wider field of my research. So um, yeah, I'm really happy to hear your comments afterwards. So... Early on a Saturday morning, in Jerusalem's well-to-do Mishkanot Shenanim area, the streets are quiet. Jewish-Israeli activists from the group Ta'ayush regularly meet here to set off for their weekly activities in the South Hebron Hills area of the occupied West Bank, often accompanied by some international visitors. This area, the South Hebron Hills, is in a southern region of the West Bank designated as Area C under the Oslo Agreements and thus officially under full Israeli control and responsibility. Many of the Palestinians living in this area are farmers. Infrastructure and social services are poor, and the Israeli civil administration carries out frequent house demolitions in the region, which, alongside the harassment and violence of Israeli settlers against Palestinian residents, makes the region an extremely difficult one in which to live. Several different Jewish-Israeli activist groups, as well as Ta'ayush, have been active in the South Hebron Hills for the past 10 to 15 years. Although these groups have different agendas and modes of working, all are active in the campaign against house demolitions and expulsions. On one of the days I joined the group in April 2011, the organisers gave a brief overview of the plans for the day and then split the activists into smaller groups to join Palestinian farmers in various locations. I was sent with three Israelis and an American to travel in a private car, rather than the minivan in which most of the activists travelled, thus allowing us to skip the stop and check by the army patrol that awaited the group, as it did every week, en route to its destination. We arrived to be greeted by five Palestinian men who came carrying tools and trees that we were to plant together in the land over which they claimed ownership, a short walk away from um, across fields overlooked by an Israeli outpost which, um, as I'm sure most of you know, is one of the settlements that's illegal even according to the Israeli authorities. So one of the really small and more extreme, so-called extreme settlements. Ilan, the most experienced of the activists and designated our group's contact person by the organisers, explained that the settlers living there in the outpost often came to disrupt the farmers whenever they tried to work their land and that we were there in the hope that our presence would let them get some more work done before disruption and to witness and record any interaction with the settlers, army or police officers. I received the task of filming the activities and Elan gave me the small video camera the organisers had brought for that purpose, together with instructions about making sure always to get a wide field of vision so that as much as possible would be captured on film. There were two soldiers already standing a short distance away from the field when we arrived. It was not the first time to Irish activists had been there, although it was not clear how they knew that we would come on that day or whether there was a constant army presence in that spot. We were able to work undistur undisturbed for around one hour in any case. After that time, one of the settlers, an older man, came down the hill from the outpost and started to shout at us. He screamed in Arabic at the Palestinians and in Hebrew towards us, shouting at Ilan in particular, who he seemed already to know, that he was a traitor and accusing him of being a Hamas supporter. The two soldiers stood by for a while but called their superior, who arrived after a few minutes. He started to ask the Palestinian farmers questions, checking the title deeds they had brought with them to ascertain whether the land did indeed belong to them, and asking about why we were there with them. In the course of this discussion, more soldiers and police officers arrived, some of whom were able to speak Arabic with the farmers. They demanded that the Palestinians come to an army office uh, nearby to show a different document than the one they had brought, which was in Arabic and without any map on it, and which the commander claimed was not a good enough proof of evidence that they owned the land. As all of this was going on, a police officer was taking photographs of each of us, as I continued to film the whole interaction, although the Israeli activists, myself, and the American remained silent, 
as we had been instructed to do by Elan at the beginning of the day. The commander then declared the area a closed military zone, as the settler was still standing nearby and shouting at the group, and things didn't seem to be calming down. And so the Palestinians started to leave, and we followed. Elan was disappointed that we had left without having been shown a written order, stating that the area was a closed military zone, which technically, he said, the army had to do before we were legally obliged to leave. Much of the aim of these Ta'ayush actions is to record occasions on which these orders have been shown, in order to prove continued Palestinian presence on the land, and that goes back to an old Ottoman law actually about dead land and the idea that if uh, an area of land is continually farmed, then that's a kind of proof of, of, of ownership. Whereas if they can say that the Palestinians haven't been there, they can uh, reclaim the land for the state. He asked, uh, so Elan asked the Palestinians why they left without waiting to see the document, the, um, the closed military zone document. And they said that they did not realize that the army had to show a written order. Elan explained to them that next time they can wait until they see such an order before they leave. One of the other Israeli activists, Ifrat, then asked Ilan why we had left without it. Ilan replied, I'm not going to tell the Palestinians what to do, and explained that in any case, as we had filmed the interactions, they could still be used by Ta'ayush in advocacy or legal discussions about the settler and military harassment of Palestinian farmers. Thus, Ilan said that he still considered the action a partially successful one. While this activism depended on much behind-the-scenes work from activists' homes, in telephone calls, organising transport, publicising their actions to other Israelis, and working in Israeli NGOs, activists' physical presence in the South Hebron Hills with Palestinians was its political and symbolic core. The focus of my paper now is therefore how groups such as Ta'ayush inhabit spaces such as the South Hebron Hills through their actions in order to perform an anti-colonial politics and the contradictions that characterise such an engagement. In analysing these practices, I engage with the political and analytical approach towards Jewish-Israeli activism and the politics of Israel-Palestine more generally that proposes decolonization as a way in which Palestinian life and resistance can be both supported in activism and reflected in scholarship. How can decolonization be practised by members of the dominant society, I wish to ask, and what does it mean to do this through physical presence on the land of, and at the side of, Palestinian residents struggling for existence in a colonial space? What I will argue is that this kind of solidarity also entails a kind of complicity, and I'll expand on what I mean by that notion and how it plays out here um, later in the paper. I reach this conclusion through a consideration of Israeli activists' intentional use of their privilege as Jewish citizens of the state to expose and challenge its modes of domination. The Saturday activities I have begun to describe were rather typical for Ta'ayush during the period of my fieldwork. Israeli activists would go to different locations depending on where a Palestinian farmer was having difficulty working their land without settler harassment, or perhaps go to help dismantle a new roadblock or clear the rubble from a water well that had been filled in by the army during a house demolition. Although cooperation and solidarity with Palestinian residents of the South Hebron Hills was central to activists' conceptions of what they were doing, it was striking to me, at least, how much this activism depended primarily on interactions with other Jewish Israelis. In the physical space in which Israeli control was further entrenching itself apace, in other words, leftist Israeli activists met with other Israelis in order to perform an alternative and anti-colonial politics. Most of the activists' inability to speak Arabic, as well as a lack of time outside of the intense and chaotic Saturday actions, prevented much communication between activists and the Palestinians they accompanied. Rather, what I want to argue is that a Jewish-Israeli cultural intimacy and its breach by the activists unfolded with a Palestinian landscape as its mise-en-scene. Another one of the actions in which I participated illustrates well the ethical and political contours of this kind of activism. I arrived on one of the Saturdays on which a deliberately more confrontational action was planned, after a week in which Israelis from one of the settlements con considered to be the most extreme in the area, so even more extreme than the one I just <laughs> mentioned, had entered a nearby Palestinian village with masked faces and physically attacked its residents. The Israeli army had not intervened to stop the violence. We were to walk up to the settlement in protest, more at the army than at the settlers, one of the organisers, Adi, explained. As the latter, the settlers were simply freaks, she said, who would not pay attention to any protest, 
but the soldiers had a legal duty to protect the Palestinians from such attacks. They did not expect that we would actually reach the settlement, but rather that the army would intercept us, and that those who chose to do so would get arrested in the process. Adi made it clear to everyone that, there were, that it was a decision to be arrested, which nobody was to feel under pressure to make, and in particular internationals or Israelis who already had open police files, or other reasons not to make themselves known to the authorities, could stand further back and avoid being detained. We thus split into smaller groups according to who wanted to be arrested or not, and according to walking ability, as we would have to hike across fields and hills in order to reach the back of the settlement without being seen in advance by the army. I joined one of those groups of mainly internationals and a few Israelis, including a woman I'll call Ravid, who wanted to avoid arrest as she worked for a major Israeli company. As we were walking towards the settlement, she explained to me that she was worried about getting fired from her job (coughs) if she were to be arrested, for any reason, but especially for taking part in this kind of political action. Just a few weeks before, she told me, she had met a work acquaintance during one of Taosha's actions, as he had been one of the soldiers who had intervened in their activities, and he was doing his reserve service at the time. Ravid told me that it had been a shock to encounter each other um, in this way, and that they had not said much to each other at the time. Later, at work, when they had talked at length about it, he had asked her what she was doing there, and she had explained a bit about Taayush to him, and about her experiences in the South Hebron Hills. She said she felt something had switched in him during the conversation, that he was going through something, a kind of process of re-education that activists often talked about as the genesis of their becoming more involved in these actions. Not just through being posted in, the area, in this area of the West Bank for his army service, Ravid explained, but because they had had this conversation, he had started to see to Irish activists from a different perspective, and not just as an irritation, as they commonly seem to be perceived by soldiers and police. Still, Ravid was nervous about having had this encounter and the possibility of her activism becoming visible to others in her workplace, so she decided to take a less prominent role that week and join the group choosing not to get arrested. As we approached the settlement, we could already see a line of soldiers standing to prevent us from entering it. We began to split up into our chosen groups, and those who were prepared to get arrested approached the soldiers and tried to pass them, while the rest of us hung back. Within a few minutes, some arrests had been made while others were still filming the scenario and making statements on a megaphone about why we had come and that this was a non-violent action in protest at the settlers' violence against Palestinians. The situation turned out to be a bit less under the activists' control than the organisers had anticipated, though, and some who had not intended to get arrested were unable to avoid it. As my group started to move further back from the soldiers, an Israeli woman activist got hold of the megaphone and announced over it in Hebrew, don't say you're just following orders, directed towards the soldiers. You know who just followed orders. Be ashamed. I have grandchildren your age. Ravid then took over the megaphone and continued. When you hear about Israeli democracy, you should reflect on that. Democracy includes something called equality, and here it seems like there's one law for the settlers, one law for Palestinians, and one law for leftists. She then began to sing the song Hero of the Defense Army by the Israeli punk band Pollyanna Frank, which maybe some of you know, which mocks the macho young soldier whose sexual conquests merge into the state's military ones. By this point, some settlers had arrived at the scene and the risk of arrest was accompanied by that of physical violence by the settlers against the activists. And so all those who had not yet been detained started to leave and walk back towards the Palestinian village after some negotiation with the army commander present about what path we would be allowed to take. So I want to pause here to consider what has been enacted in these encounters in the South Hebron Hills. Although the name Ta'ayush literally means living together in Arabic, and activists would often explain this meaning as they talked about the group and its cooperative modes of action, what was striking to me about this Saturday action and others I participated in was the lack of emphasis on Palestinians' experiences or even on Palestinian-Israeli cooperation. Rather, this activism's orientation towards and against other Jewish Israelis, settlers and state authorities, performed a political breach of cultural intimacy, as a way both to expose and to disturb how Jewish-Israeli citizenship is tied up in uncomfortable ways with state violence. Both the physical movements of the activists and the ways in which they drew on culturally resonant symbolic tropes in their verbal interactions can be read here as an intimate form of communication with those deemed to be like us by the activists 
other Jewish Israeli citizens. This emphasis on common Israeli citizenship and highlighting of the ways in which it privileges Jewish subjects specifically is what was enacted by the activists' approach to the soldiers, blocking the entrance to the settlement. Unlike Palestinians, who of course would be much more likely to be shot were they to approach the soldiers in this manner, the physical approach of a Jewish Israeli body towards the state apparatus is an invitation for that body to be restrained and disciplined, but with the knowledge that it will be unlikely to suffer the kind of grievous physical harm faced by other kinds of subjects. The action sets in motion a chain of legal procedures that would result, in all likelihood, in the activists released by a judge after up to 24 hours in a police cell, with the possibility of a criminal charge to be tried and punished at a later date. In thus eliciting and exposing state power, the Ta'ayush activists also reveal its uneven terrain, that they, as Jewish citizens, are differently subject to its workings than the Palestinians in the South Hebron Hills, as in other areas in Palestine Israel. This physical method of exposing the injustice of Israeli rule was then echoed in the activists' cries over the megaphone. Addressing the soldiers in Hebrew, and thus evoking again their common status as Israeli Jews, the older female activist first of all alludes to the Holocaust, which is of course a common trope in all kinds of Israeli political discussions, with their statement, don't say you're just following orders, of course recalling Adolf Eichmann's Nuremberg defence. She then draws on her age to suggest a maternal authority, which is intended to shame the soldiers as having betrayed a shared Jewish-Israeli ethos on yet another level. With Ravid's subsequent return to the discourse of citizenship and democracy, she links this breach of morality to a concern with inequality and injustice, finally turning to expose and mock the soldiers' own bodily incorporation into the state regime with the Pollyanna Frank song. Although she had recently experienced a more sober and nuanced encounter with a colleague with whom she felt able to discuss the situation in the South Hebron Hills, as well as individual soldiers' roles in perpetuating injustice, in general these kinds of denunciations of Jewish-Israelis' actions and their consequent responsibility to act differently were performed in these more dramatic and confrontational ways in precisely these sorts of activist encounters in places like the South Hebron Hills. On my way back to Tel Aviv after the action, I received a phone call from a friend, Yael. She called to check with me that I was okay, having heard through social media networks about the arrests in the South Hebron Hills, as she, she knew I had planned to go that day with Ta'ayush. I assured her that I was fine, and that I had been able to make the choice not to get arrested. The others intended to get arrested, you know, I explained to her. They had planned it that way. She replied, of course they did. I hadn't needed to explain the tactics to her. She was heavily involved in this kind of activism and knew how Ta'ayush and similar groups worked. She understood that when activists got arrested in this way, it was likely to have been intentional. At the time, I didn't reflect on the way in which she took for granted the intentionality of the arrests. Even though activists tended to narrate reports of these arrests as the shocking enactment of a heavy-handed and authoritarian state in the face of non-violent political action, when they talked about these occasions in the press and on social media. Anybody involved in this kind of activism knew that these actions were more often than not um, staged to provoke a certain reaction and that the army and police could be relied upon to use physical violence and or to detain activists. This gap, though, between the intentionality of these actions and the performance of surprise that they are unfolding deserves further, further consideration, I think. Since when Jewish Israeli activists invite and meet the force of the state in the form of military and police violence and arrests, and yet profess shock when they indeed receive such reactions, in the same moment they partially shift the focus of both their and their audience's attention from what the Palestinians face to ethical and political relations among different Jewish Israelis. So in relation to these kinds of moments, I want to consider the idea of complicity and this activism activism's elements of performance and staging. In other anthropological and scholarly analysis of performance in social movements, confrontations with state authorities are often understood as political performances that enable not only the envisage, envis, envisioning or prefiguring of utopian political futures, but also the development of activist subjectivities that bring energy and mo motivation to these movements. So I'm thinking of a lot of the um, work more recently on the Occupy movement, um, and other kinds of similar protests um, by people like David Graeber and other anthropologists and social scientists 
who argue that there's this kind of collective subjectivity made within the, the moment of the protest and the organization up, up to the protest. The activism I'm describing here certainly shared the element of staging or performance as these other examples, and on some occasions also the affective qualities of joyfulness and play that contributed to the development of certain subjectivities among activists, as well as feelings of solidarity and connectedness within the group that enabled them to continue with their often challenging practices. What I argue is central to this activism, however, was not so much a creation of different worlds to the one they lived in, which that scholarship that I referred to kind of posits that they're creating the world they want to exist in, in the moment of the demonstration, but here rather an exposure of the violence and injustice of the existing reality, as well as the crucial centering and challenging of their own entanglement within its politics. Contrary to those accounts of activist performances that emphasize the creation of alternative realities through performance and storytelling, then, I'm currently thinking through the notion of a theatrics of complicity as a key feature of this particular case of nonviolent activism and civil disobedience. A theatrics of complicity describes the way in which this activism operates by staging a confrontation with state authorities that allows activists to exploit the cultural intimacy between themselves and the police officers or soldiers with whom they come into contact in order to expose their own privilege as Jewish Israeli citizens and thus a generalized complicity with the Israeli state. This is enacted through physical presence in Palestinian areas, presented as an act of cooperation, cooperation and solidarity with its Palestinian residents, subjects who, however, appear only in the background of this activism. They can only appear as such, I claim, because the potency and reverberations of this activism depend precisely on a Jewish-Israeli cultural poetics of complicity with colonial do domination. It is the very spaces in which this domination is most visibly in the making, such as the South Hebron Hills, that give a certain opportunity for these relations to be exposed in the ways I've described. Precisely through employing their own status as Jewish-Israeli citizens in these confrontational performances, I claim, these activists unsettle and place in question the ethics and politics of a militaristic political, political culture more broadly. In other words, they make the distinction between themselves and state authorities through the dramatics of their activism by rendering visible how close and familiar they are to them. So this is what I mean by complicity in its performative sense, a simultaneous exposure and refusal of complicity with state violence. At the same time, though, I also seek to understand complicity as an affective and subjective state, one that is more ambivalent and perhaps more troubling as a concept. Throughout my research with Jewish-Israeli left radical activists, I observed and sensed an acute feeling of complicity with actions of the Israeli state on the part of its most vocal internal critics. These feelings of entanglement with, and thus responsibility for, the oppression of Palestinians as well as others in Israel-Palestine seem to permeate motivations, experiences, and relationships within the activist community. I would argue that this subjective state informs the performative nature of the activism that I have just described, as the phenomenology of activists present in Palestinian areas, where this sense of being implicated in the perpetration of injustice is most clearly confronted, ultimately tells of the difficulty of inhabiting an ethical space of resistance when one's very person has been made to represent that which one resists. Accounts of this activism that either celebrate it as a heroic form of resistance or only complain at its failure to truly challenge the status quo seem to miss this space of contradiction, this grey zone, which I would argue we need to understand as part of any process of social and political change or potential change. The anthropologist Jessica Greenberg argues that to interpret any political affect that falls short of revolutionary sentiment as failure, and I quote here, runs the risk of reinscribing a binary of hope and disappointment that defines the negative affective experience as a form of loss, end quote. So Greenberg was referring to the pragmatism of student activists in Serbia, which is her um, case study, um, coming to terms with disappointment rather than experiencing that disappointment as a form of failure to bring about radical change. So she was critiquing the idea that disappointment is a, is a, indexes failure within activism and says actually it's a mode of engaging politically. However, the binary of hope and disappointment that Greenberg describes as a problem in scholarly analysis of social movements 
was in many ways also a, prob a problem for the acti activism I consider here. Jewish Israeli activists themselves dwelled in their disappointment when their actions fell short of what they described as real challenges to the Israeli state. An impossible desire for purity in their political action was thus an ethnographic predicament and not only a complaint of those analysing or evaluating their politics. In considering complicity a central feature of activist subjectivity, I thus share Greenberg's framing of negative affective experience as a space through which political engagement can develop. But I also wonder whether activist desires to negate that negativity, to be free from such complicity, and the impossibility of realising such desires, may lead us to interpret them indeed as a certain experience of loss, as an uncomfortable reckoning with the impurity of ethics and politics. In this way, we might be able to hold experiences of loss and of the negative in our vision of politics as a set of difficult confrontations with violence that also shape activist subjectivities and their attendant political practices. Thus, complicity is not an accusation, but rather an analysis of how dissent can, can emerge and develop while bearing the trace of the violence from which it is born. In this case, activists' physical presence and confrontation with state authorities in Palestinian areas where settler and military aggression are at their height were key spatial practices through which the negative political affect of complicity was most intensely felt. For if land and territory have become central to Zionism and Israeli nationalism, both in practice and symbolically, this activism similarly operates with the physical and symbolic qualities of space at its core, Activists' attempts to expose and challenge the violent, violent expansion of what Oren Yiftachol calls the Israeli frontier plays with nationalist and colonial territorial practices to create an anti-colonial presence that is not that of the colonized, the Palestinians, but rather comes from a position of cultural intimacy with the colonizing group itself. These activists use familiarity and likeness to unsettle a presumed united national project through alternative spatial practices, as I've described in this talk. Activists' reliance both on dominant preoccupations with land and territory and on cultural intimacy in its breach may be interpreted by some as an evasion of supporting Palestinian modes of resistance in favour of engaging in Jewish-Israeli cultural poetics and thus not achieving decolonization. I would like to suggest, however, that the entanglement of these activist practices and narratives with dominant Israeli ones is precisely what gives it its anti-colonial character. So this is an interpretation which attempts to recognize the coexistence of colonial, post-colonial, and anti-colonial subjectivities and practices in contemporary Palestine and Israel, as well as the gray zones that permeate any colonial situation. The line between being or not being in or part of a colonial situation is very often more blurred than any clear colonial, post-colonial, decolonial distinction can apprehend. So I'm attempting to address here what I think is a problem with certain uses of the decolonization framework and the way they posit the possibility of clearly and cleanly disengaging from complicity with colonial do domination. Rather than suggesting that activism and scholarship can only be either colonizing or decolonizing, guilty of furthering colonial power or celebrated for challenging it, the activism described here calls for a less purist and perhaps also less gratifying analysis. As Mark Sanders argues, and he's um, writing in relation to the figure of the intellectual in apartheid South Africa, advocacy on behalf of racialized and colonized others under a political system imposing such separations can be considered what he calls a kind of responsibility and complicity. In his analysis, complicity takes on two meanings, and the distinction between the two meanings of complicity is crucial for, for his and also for my analysis. So the first meaning of complicity is a broader existential one that harks back to the ethics of Emmanuel Levinas in its sketching of a general, generalized condition of relatedness among human beings that makes possible the notion of responsibility. So the idea is that we're all basically bound up in one social system and so therefore are, we're, we're always impacting and affecting each other. And so there's a complicity in what happens to others just through that very being within a social uh, situation. So that's the first um, dis uh, definition. The second definition of complicity is narrower and connotes particular acts or failures to act within historically specific situations that result in complicity with injustice, as in the more common understanding when we use the word complicity. Um, so, for example, Israeli institutions are complicit with the occupation. 
that kind of um, use of the term. So it's only by rejecting the possibility of separation and the premise of apartheid, and thus recognizing the more generalized notion of complicity, saying there's no way we can be separate, there's no way that we can hold Palestinians and Israelis as separate nations, peoples, um, histories, Sadras argues that one can also begin to struggle against practices of domination by way of negotiating one's own particular acts of complicity, so the second kind of complicity. So they both go together, being able to negotiate the particular historic, historically specific acts of complicity require a, a recognition of the more generalized form of complicity. And it's this confrontation with specific forms of complicity through a recognition of the more generalized kind that also characterizes the activism I'm describing. And I think this complicates a reading of this activism as simply a heroic resistance purified of its implication in the forms of power and violence it aims to subvert. As I hope I've demonstrated in this paper, these practices of dissent and solidarity rely on a tacit acknowledgement of activists' enmeshment in the power structures they aim to challenge. And thus I'd like to conclude by arguing the following. Activists' failures to be at one with ethical conflicts and emotional ambivalences emerge as refusals of complicity that in fact intimate responsibility in complicity, but are also felt as a loss, perhaps a painful reminder of what the anthropologist Catherine Ewing has called the illusion of wholeness. But equally, they may be the basis on which activists continue to act, to shift their relatedness with others and complicities with violence towards different ethical and political conditions. This integration of the negative and of grey zones into conceptions of ethics and politics, in other words, does not need to imply futility. Rather, a notion of complicity and attention to the ways in which it is both performed and acutely felt may help to outline, outline how Jewish-Israeli activists' attempts at solidarity with Palestinians entail both entanglements with violence and a powerful challenge to the Israeli state's continued use of it. Thank you. the paper I, I wound up doing that thing that one does when you're first an activist and then an academic and I'm, I just um, I, I couldn't separate between what I thought about the paper until the very like last few pages and then I could get all you know I could argue with you know the terms and all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. um, first of all I want to think I think that you're really right and that you're really on to something about that un uncomfortability mm. um, of kind of being on site and seeing how Palestinian land people are the backdrop of whatever unfolds. And it, and it almost doesn't matter what's going on. I mean, mm. literally, this is what, as soon as there's Jewish Israelis around, so what's going to happen is going to be a conversation between Jewish Israelis. And that's part, and I think that that's something that more people are coming to realize, is that um, you can't enact change if you're reenacting those power structures. Mm -hmm. and, if, and you can't get out of it as long as the issue is about being the people of light and being the people of darkness. And what I mean by that, and I, and, and I use that term specifically, in, in Hebrew it's b'nei or and b'nei choshech, so the people of the light and people of darkness. So it's the battle between those that have seen the light and those that are still in the darkness in the sense that um, it's, it's used by everyone. So, 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 like, so leftist activists will use it against um, people serving in the military, um, soldiers would use it against leftist activists, set, they will use it against settlers. So this is the way this binary between those that have seen the light and those that are still in the darkness is very present. And, and as long as that exists, there is not, not even room to ask the question about um, what do Palestinians want to do with this? And I, what I found fascinating was that description deeply I enjoyed the deeply feminist description of this middle-aged white guy telling everybody around to either be quiet or 
and then explaining why he wouldn't be the one to tell Palestinians what to do, and it just and what happened was uh, I couldn't breathe. Like I couldn't. So many of people, so many people that joined these activities can't breathe half the time because of this situation in which you're stuck in a military situation all over again, with a bunch of men telling you what to do. Mm-hmm. And, and and it's an incredible it's an incredible feeling. And and I I think that. The other side of it, so I, I get I, the responsibility and complicity, I buy it. I buy it. I do think that there's also a politics of self-blame. Mm. So the responsibility is also a self-blame. I'm not doing enough. I should be doing more. The ones that, and this is something that activists just have no matter what they're, it's just a feature of a certain kind of activism. But... Um, and I think particularly direct action activism is always the sense like, oh, you know, we, I could have done this, I could have made a bigger spectacle. Um, I could have done this more. Here's an opportunity that was missed or whatever. And within that guilt, though, it is precisely that guilt that becomes self-centered. So it's the guilt that makes the responsibility be, instead of it being a responsibility about shifting political power into what am I doing? And there, there is the, the sense of the cathartic, you know, the cathartic sense of, you know, you get arrested and then you're tired and all that stuff, but you've done your part for that moment and then there's this easing up of that guilt. And, and I think that... Um, it's, it's really funny because it resonated with me with something that happened this morning. You must, uh, I, I suppose some of, some of the audience heard um, that B'Tselem decided mm-hmm. to stop um, com- uh, issuing complaints to, uh, to military and police and uh, other legal structures. And um, so I knew about this on Sunday and I was waiting to see the reaction. And all I could think was for the last three days, it's like 20 years late. It's 20 years late, for God's sake. But there was, I did have the sense that here there was this moment where there's a part that's giving up about the part that we are the people of the light fighting against the darkness in whatever way we can and saying, this isn't working. Not only is it not working, it's, it's aiding in, this, in the perpetuation of a power structure. And so... Um, it's obvious that, that, that more people are understanding that part of it. The one thing that was missing in the account, and the truth is I was pretty amazed by how accurate I thought it was and how re- illuminating it was for me to read. It was very illuminating. It was um, um, like almost illuminating my memories. It was funny. But one thing was missing was class. Mm was the, 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 the differences in class between the soldiers and the settlers and the activists. And regardless of who these activists were, and I wasn't, you know, I didn't know who they were, maybe one or two. But what you know is that the activists come from a very privileged community that not only does enjoy does enjoy the priv- the privilege of Jewish Israeliness, it enjoys certain cultural assets mm-hmm. that um, usually, especially if it's border police, that's for sure they don't enjoy the same the same as and then depends who it, who's who it is in the military. That's why I found what was very interesting was the way um, one of the activists could have the conversation with the guy in the reserve duty, and that had to do with the fact that they f- were from a shared class. Mm. So it's class that actually mediates that possibility mm. to talk. And, and so I think one of the major parts of this is that into, I mean, if Palestinians are the b- backdrop of it, there's also... Um, the issue of your access to choosing your type of complicity. 
and that's something that um, that is a matter of privilege as well. Um, and the last thing is that I think that one one of the most um, illuminating things for me was thinking about the, the idea of the shared utopia and how yes there's a moment where that where that shared utopia needs to come forth it needs to be part of of the political imagination. Activists need to see that they're pushing the limits of a political imagination, that they're opening up a path for alternative. And it's true that these actions don't do that in any way. Because if there's that landscape, there's that landscape in which the action is trying to feed into a twisted legal system in which... People are trying to help farmers be on the land for X amount of time. And the truth is that the whole, that whole invention of the, 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 the Ottoman Mawat and all that invention, and it's literally a legal invention that you could uh, appropriate land because of this thing, is completely twisted and it's just a method of, used by the action. So the point is, if the action is to uphold that, and to allow it to continue, then I'm not so sure that the whole that that it just needs to look like that at all, and that it that it is about solidarity. Mm. And and maybe a better way to think of it is okay. Let's you know, what's important is sumud, letting people stay on their land as much as possible, as long as possible, and doing that. And whatever that means, doing that. But then it's not about the mawat. It's not about. It's not about doing. It's not about showing how violent the Israeli state is and then putting it on YouTube. But then it's about okay, what helps Sumud? And, and I mean, yes, yeah, getting people papers. It's uh, you know, it's economic issues. It's being able to stay with your family. I mean, it's it's a whole range of other things that is not necessarily about running around on certain lands and trying to plant trees in them. Mm-hmm. But it's, um, and on a broader perspective, I, I, think, I think the responsibility and complicity really works. I think the spectacle part I would work on more because what's really important is the fact that Palestinians are just a backdrop mm-hmm. and that needs to be discussed much, much more because mm-hmm. that's, the, that's the colonial. Yeah. That's the colonial. It's like, you have people, they are participating, they're there, they, they are talking, they're physically there, and they're not. They're complete, they're, they're absentee presentees or whatever it is in the, in the deepest sense. And, and so I think that's where it lies, and that's where I think the contribution can be very, very significant. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Should I respond, or? Um, yeah, well, thank you. Um, it's brilliant. I, I guess I'll just respond to the, the issue of class because I think that's it's something that it's very difficult in kind of shorter papers to bring out. Also, I guess because what I'm describing is this perfor- part of the performance is the performance as if there's just like like you said the good guys and the bad guys. There's or there's just Israelis and Palestinians, and this is also kind of a lot of the especially as a lot of this work I think is kind of internationally oriented, like it's being performed for an external audience often, then the kinds of distinctions that you or others on the ground will feel, like class, race, um, distinctions which often overlap on the ground are then made invisible, again, um, in representations of it. So I guess I really don't want to do that again <laughs> in my own work. Um, and it's something I always struggle with. But I think even... Also, I guess, I, just to be very frank, I guess one of the things that makes me struggle with it is that there is an analysis of um, 
class distinctions within Israeli politics and within the Israeli left specifically that says that basically the radicals are a bunch of white Ashkenazi privileged um, middle class Tel Avivis and that they're the, the kind of others of that class system so Mizrahim, working class, right wing Israelis whatever these kind of generalizations come to be then are the the ones that are also oppressed. And I'm, it just it always turns in again to the oppressors and the oppressed in this mm-hmm. very black and white way, which is difficult then to complicate without making it into an apologetics, right? Mm-hmm. So how you can still bring out complicity or different kinds of complicity on the part of all the different actors without um, falling into one binary or another, I guess. So thank you, yeah, I'll definitely try and think how to do it (laughs) more smartly.